Read-Only Mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Write Your Own Memoir, Part 1, brought to you by Share, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network, and featuring our special guest, Abigail Thomas. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a 39-year-old nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of those who've been there. All services are free of charge and include helpline, support groups, and educational programs. For more information on SHARE's extensive programming, please visit our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So now let me tell you a little bit about the format of this program and how you can participate. All participants are muted so that we can all clearly hear the presenter. If you have a question during or after the presentation, please submit the question through the question pane in your control panel. You can access the question pane by clicking on the red arrow in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. When the presentation is over, we'll open up for questions, and I'll field the questions and read them to the presenter. So now I'd like to introduce Catherine O'Brien, board member of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. Catherine? Thanks, Christine. Hi, this is Catherine O'Brien, and I have been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2009. As Christine said, I'm a board member with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. MBCN is a national, independent, nonprofit, patient led advocacy organization dedicated to education and empowering women and men living with metastatic breast cancer. MBCN was founded in 2004 by Jane Sawyer and Nina Schulman and continues to advocate on behalf of the unique needs of all who are living with stage four breast cancer. MBCN held its first conference for metastatic patients and their caregivers in 2006. In 2015, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Forum at the Susan F. Smith Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston will be presented in conjunction with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. Watch for more details at mbcn.net. And now I would like to tell you about today's speaker. Abigail Thomas, the daughter of renowned science writer Lewis Thomas, author of The Lives of a Cell, is the mother of four children and the grandmother of 12. Her academic education stopped when, pregnant with her oldest daughter, she was asked to leave Bryn Mawr during her first year. She's lived most of her life on Manhattan's Upper West Side and was for a time a book editor and for another time a book agent. Then she started writing for publication. Her first three books, Getting Over Tom, An Actual Life, and Herb's Pajamas were works of fiction. Her memoir, A Three Dog Life, was named one of the best books of 2006 by the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. It won the 2006 Inspirational Memoir Award, memoir award given by Books for a Better Life. Abigail is also author of Safekeeping, a memoir, and Thinking About Memoir, and the soon-to-be-published What Comes Next and How to Like It, a memoir coming out at the end of March from Scribner's. She teaches writing workshops and leads the memoir group at Kingston's, uh, Kingston's Oncology Support Program of the Health Alliance of the Hudson Valley. Abigail lives in Woodstock, New York with her dogs, whom we may hear today. Welcome, <laughs> Abby. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. I'm really honored to be here. I want to say that you may hear dogs through, <laughs> throughout this, whatever this is. Um, and I also want to say that I've never spoken for 40 minutes at any one time before. So if you find me um, lagging, let me know. I think, I think the first thing to talk about is not just writing memoir, but writing. Because it was a long time before I stopped saying to myself, who do you think you are? I mean, I would write. I had written poems in the 70s, and that was fine. The words didn't have to go all the way across the page, and I managed to get some of those done. But writing, writing anything other than that was, it was terrifying to me. I'd start to write something, and then I'd 
crumple it up and throw it into the waste ba- basket thinking, you don't, you're not a writer. Writers are different. Writers are special. You know, it was just a real writer was somebody different, part of a club nobody had asked me to join, someone who'd gone through some kind of initiation into the mysteries. And I thought you had to know something. I think you had to know, I thought you had to know something secret, something big, something I didn't know. Magic words are a charm or an incantation or receive an invitation I hadn't been tendered before you could sit down to it. I, I thought you had to know what you were doing. But in fact, knowing what you're doing is um, not an advantage. I think it's best if you don't know where you're going and you just start somewhere. You, don't, you, just, you just have to begin. You just have to find a place to start. You don't need anybody's permission. You don't need to know anything. Your life is what you've specialized in. It's education enough, at least, for the raw material of stories and and memoir. I've written three memoirs. I'll start, I guess I'll start by the reason that I'm here. My daughter, Catherine, at the age of 39, was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which was terrifying for all of us. Um, it's a scary kind of breast cancer. All breast cancer is scary, but this, this, this scared me and everybody else in our family and friends to death. I had written half a book. It was a book about a friendship that had a hole blown through it, but it wasn't really a book. And I couldn't write any more. And I didn't know how to write about Catherine. I just didn't feel, I just felt wrong about it until one day when one of my bad dogs about whom I'd written much ran out the dog door with Catherine's favorite wig in her mouth. And that gave me a way to start writing about my daughter's having cancer. We got so much help from so many people in the Hudson Valley that I very badly once she had been all right for a year or two years, I wanted very badly to give back what I'd been given. And the the thing I'm best at is a writing workshop. So I asked at the Benedictine Cancer Center if I could give a workshop, you know. Well, sure, they said. And we were going to go for five weeks. And it's been almost three years now. Uh, that room on Thursday afternoons is the room where I'm most alive every week. Everybody, almost everybody there has metastatic cancer. And the room is ringing with now, this minute, this is what counts. I give assignments and everybody reads what they've made of those assignments every week. I can't tell you how remarkable this group is. I mean, we're the idea that what we're here for is to be witness to one another's lives is just that's what this is about. Um, I'll, I'll read later some things that that this group has written, but I guess right now, I guess I'll talk about memoir because it's a specific kind of writing I, I also want to say that every time I sit down to write something I'm a beginner I don't know what I'm doing I don't know where I'm going I have nothing but doubt so if that's the way any of you feel you've got company <laughs> um, memoir at least in the in the cancer group I'm not sure how different it is from other groups, but the kinds of memoir we've had are there's a wonderful woman named Suzanne Dean who wanted to leave a record for her children of what her life had been like. It had begun a long time ago. You know, she was in her late 70s, and just, just to leave 
just to write her memories down so that her grandchildren and I guess even her children had some idea of what life had been like. And they were wonderful, wonderful pieces. But the other kind of, another kind of memoir, and there are millions of kinds, is to try and figure out how you got here from there. You have to figure out where the here is and where the there is. And sometimes you don't know where the here is until you start with the there, with where you where you began. It's an amazing journey. Um, my, my first memoir is a book called Safekeeping. I had never written anything like that before. But a, an old friend of mine, a husband I'd had, and been married to for a while, but after we had gotten divorced, we'd really known each other for 27 years. And the things we had done wrong and the ways we had not been helpful to the kids while he was alive were kind of still balls up in the air. Well, we could fix this. Something We could do something that would change this so that everybody would be fine. We would just rewrite everything but then he died and I began writing these little pieces out of nowhere I had no idea what I was doing it was like popcorn I just wrote and wrote and it was not in chronological order and it made no sense but I was old enough to know that you don't mess with the muse I mean if you're getting something write it down and that book is written in first person and third person and second person and it the chronology mixes up but it does make a kind of emotional sense so I'm here to say that there are no hard and fast rules for writing memoir it doesn't all have to be chronological it doesn't have to be just first person you can do it any way you want I gave it to my, or my agent gave it to my editor, who had been the editor of the first three books of fiction, and she didn't like it. She didn't like that it jumped around. She didn't like that it wasn't chronological, and she said, I think you should write a novel now about about this marriage and this relationship. But my life hadn't been lived like a novel. My life was a series, as I remember it, was a series of moments some important and some not important, but what I remembered, because memory really, I mean, memoir really is memoir. It's not a long resume. It's not this happened and then this happened and then this happened. It's what you remember. Memory is such a funny thing. You know, your memory will be very different from your sister's memory or your mother's memory or your brother's memory but it's yours and how you remember the way you lived your life is what makes you who you are and there's not much to be done about it I remember having a very vivid memory of something in our childhood and I wrote about it and showed it to my sister Judy and she said no that's not what happened no 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 that wasn't there that was this other place no 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 you've got it all wrong but since I had, I couldn't go back and take it away. I couldn't amputate what my memory had been, even though I stood corrected. Still, the way I had remembered it had turned me into who I was. So don't worry about anybody saying, nah, that didn't happen. Nah, well, nobody ever said that. Write it as you remember it, because that's what memoir is. I had a student once who had been told by her mother that she had had a twin brother who died at birth. And she believed that until well into her 30s when she found out she had never had a twin brother who died at birth. It was just her. But how to go back and change who you are living with that memory, I am sure 
that made her that made her who she was and you sort of can't undo it that's that's sort of an aside and it's sort of a wildly i mean it, it nobody not everybody has that kind of that kind of thing to deal with um there are many many ways to do a memoir there's a wonderful memoir by Eileen Beckerman which maybe some of you know called love loss and what i wore and it's a bunch of pictures she's drawn of certain things she had on at certain moments in her life it's extremely moving it's also quite funny but it's a way of it's a way of recording what her life was like by what she remembered wearing when certain things happened i'd given an assignment once was to write two pages about a time you were inappropriately dressed for the occasion my memory of that and my little piece i wrote was about being <laughs> in 1968 part of an orgy in the East Village and I was the only one who kept my dress on it was a new dress and I looked really good in it and I refused to take it off but I gave this assignment at a um, one of those writing things in the summer at Tin House which is a magazine in, in Portland and a woman wrote about something she'd never written about she wrote about her first husband who had been helping somebody load or unload a pickup truck because he was moving and he didn't even know the guy he was just a helpful man and during the process he was hit something fell and hit him over the head and by the time he'd gotten to the hospital he'd been declared brain dead and she remembered walking on the roof of the hospital trying to decide whether to take him off life support or not and she remembered thinking she was wearing flip-flops and cutoffs and a t-shirt and she remembered thinking these are the wrong clothes to be wearing while you're making this kind of decision it was a wonderful piece and it was the first time She'd written about this awful accident. I think it's very difficult sometimes to write about something huge directly. You know, I think I think you need to find a side door into this kind of into this kind of very difficult moment. Now as as for memoir and as for writing itself it's the, it's the way I ground myself and it's what keeps me sane I think it's as helpful for everyone as it is for me this is the way I try and make sense of my life and what's happened and how to find meaning in what is otherwise a completely meaningless experience I don't believe that there's a reason for everything but I do believe that you can find something I do believe you can find a meaning in it even if it's just who you are and how you've been changed it's my husband my my second husband had um, a traumatic brain injury and he could remember pretty much nothing of the immediate past he said he said in a moment of perfect clarity he said pretend this is how he described it pretend you're walking up the street with your friend you're looking in windows but right behind you is a man with a huge paint roller filled with white paint and he's painting over everywhere you've been erasing everything he erases your friend you don't even remember his name that was as terrifying and clear a message about what it is like to lose your stories I think one of the most important things about writing memoir is 
what you find out that you didn't know you knew or where you get to when you thought you knew what the ending was to get to that place and realize no that's not the ending there's more here it's the discovery and it's the it's the surprise the only rules there are for memoir there are no rules for memoir which makes it even harder but the only rules for memoir are to be as honest as you can and, and to write about the darkness which is something that's something nobody wants to write about but to go there into the basement and look at the darkest places in your head and mind once you do that once it's brought up to the light it no longer has the power that it had when it was hidden and you'll find that it's helpful for you and it's very helpful for other people who who might read what you what you've written what goes in is everything you can't worry about what your parents will think or your sister will think or the electrician will think or your dentist will think you have to put it all in and if there are things that will be painful for others to read and your and your your meaning is not revenge but clarity and if you don't put these things in what you will have made is a three-legged table it has to go in i do think that revenge is a crummy a crummy reason to write memoir and if you're into that i think sometimes fiction is better because you don't ever want to appear as a victim god forbid or as an angel you know i think if you don't find out things about yourself that you wish you didn't know you're probably not going far enough into the into the dark basement I think there are also different sides of us with different kinds of memoir. I think if you're writing about having an autistic child, you're writing about you're writing as the mother you are. You're not writing as the businesswoman, you're not writing as the abused child of horrible, you know, you're writing as the mother and that gives you your voice. When I wrote Safekeeping, which was as it finally turned out, how to figure out how a girl born in the 40s turned into the woman she became in the 90s, I was really just writing as as a female, you know, with all the things that had happened along the way. And when I wrote A Three Dog Life, which was about Rich's accident, I was writing as his wife. So think about the story you most want to tell or try a whole bunch of different stories but you'll find there's a part of you not all of you but a part of you that focuses on what it is you want to write about if you're writing about cancer then you're writing about cancer you're writing about what it gave you what it took away what you learn it's a it's a mind-blowing thing for me to hear what what people have written we we put out a book in this workshop and there was a woman named Carol Dwyer and her first uh her first exercise was called the wrong line hey excuse me over here am i in the wrong line hello hello don't they hear me hello I think I must be in the wrong line. Someone just told me I have stage 4 metastatic breast cancer. That's not the line I meant to stand in. There must be a mistake. I was eating fruit and vegetables, going to the gym. I nursed both my children and took vitamins. If there were seven things on the list to prevent cancer, I was doing at least six at the very least. And it goes on from there. It's very funny and the anger is there, but it's 
it's under it's under the surface. She wrote a wonderful book called Enough, which was published privately. Um, there are me there are memoirs that are books of poems. I think somebody once told me there was a memoir comprised entirely of lists. There are, um, as I said, there's the love loss. And you can't, you can do anything you want as long as it works. There are no rules. Anything as long as it works. The only real rule is that you have to be, you have to be honest. And it doesn't all have to be soul-bearing honesty. But you do have to be honest when you get to the hard parts. I think when something gets in the way, as it often does, and you find yourself saying, I can't possibly write about that. I, I can't. I can't write about that. I think the way to get through that is to grab the bull by the horns and say, I can't write about this because my mother will be furious because blah, blah, blah. I can't write about this because it puts somebody in a bad light. I can't write about this because it makes me sound so selfish and so terrible. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Never, ever worry about what anybody, what anybody's going to think. Memoir is written first first and always and foremost for ourselves. You know, it's a way to figure out. And it's an adventure. You don't know what you're going to do. That's the fun part. You think you're going to write about this, and then you find that you've gone off to the left or the right, and you're writing about something else, which turns out to be really important. It's, it's an adventure, and it's a surprise. And if you don't surprise yourself, you're probably not going to surprise your reader. But I also think that the last thing you think of when you sit down to write is who your reader is going to be. Because who cares? The reader and the point of this is for you to understand or get somewhere with something that is impossible, is impossible to make sense of. Um, there was a poem, I think you guys have got it on your website, a poem I didn't understand at all by Kay Ryan um, that produced a poem in my, well, she's not a student because I learned more from these people than I ever, ever could have learned otherwise, but the last line of the poem by Kay, Kay Ryan is, uh, what the body wants is so exact. And although I had absolutely no idea what the poem was about, I gave the assignment, what the body wants is so exact. And Roberta wrote this wonderful, wonderful poem, which has become one of my favorite poems in the world, which I think you guys can read on the website. She had... Roberta had stage four small cell lung cancer, metastatic. And to be able to write this kind of poem, or just to find this in herself, the joy, the joy that's mixed in with mortality. Um, I won't read it because you guys have it, but it's one of the things that came out of the workshop. And I think what what makes it easiest and if you guys are all far flung or if you meet each other or get connected to each other I think it's a rare, very very important thing to make a group of your own where you're writing about what's going on or what went on or what you're hoping for or when you were six years old I think it's so important to share this with each other um, and I can't tell you how to do it, but it's it's a very it's wonderful. It's wonderful for for everybody. Um, let me think now. You don't want to. I've, I've already said this. You don't want to be a victim. If you're going to be a victim, then 
write, write a story. Or if you're going to be a victim, be a victim and see where it takes you. Because it may take you someplace surprising. Um, let me think now. When I got stuck with the last memoir I wrote, I had written sort of half a book. And it wasn't a book. But it was at the moment when Daphne, my dog, dragged Catherine's wig out the door that I saw, oh my God, I've got a whole, there's a whole other thing to do here. And it has to do with mortality and fear and aging and love and kind of everything in the world. And I had absolutely no idea that that was going to come from it. She's been well now for almost three years, so I'm very, very grateful. What else can I say? It's a wonderful thing to do, even if what you're doing is trying and failing. I think failure, failure is the first step on the path taking you somewhere. And I think writing has to start with writing badly or writing well and then getting stopped but it's not going to be perfect the first time around but the story your story has to be more important than your ego you have to be willing to write badly to get to the part where you're writing what you really want to write you have to keep at it. I keep a diary. I don't call it a journal because that sounds so posh and fancy. But I carry a notebook with me all the time and I write down whatever comes to mind or grocery lists or pick up the dry cleaning. Of course, I don't have any dry cleaning. I put it all in the wash. Um, but if you get in the habit of writing, that's a, that's a very big deal. Nothing great, nothing special, just whatever hits you at the moment is, um, is really, really helpful. And I also want to say here that sometimes having a, a bad memory, <laughs> as I do, is more helpful than having total recall. Because if you have total recall, it's awfully hard to sift through that and find the story find the thread that's the most important thing so um, a, th a, a, a three dog life my last book was written as it happened as Rich was hurt and what that did to change our lives and our marriage and my feelings about myself and him but mostly it's been Mem memory, you know, mostly it's been what I what I remember. Not knowing where I'm going. You don't have to know where you're going or what you're doing. I don't know that I have anything more organized to say here, but I'll look at some of the uh, questions that were that were written. Oh, I love this one. Parts of my life are pretty boring. Should I skip those parts? I remember being at Northwestern University a while back, and somebody in the to talk about memoir, and somebody who was actually a professor there said, "You know, it was pretty. Bo you know, a lot of it was pretty boring. Do you think I can make some stuff up and put it in there?" And <laughs> well, no. Um, but what might be interesting is to say, well, this part is really boring. God, I wish I'd been, and then whatever you wish you'd been doing, you can write about. And that will be as much a part of who you are as what you wish had been a part of who you are. That will tell as much about you to the reader or to yourself, because that's really what this is about. Um, and skip the parts, skip the parts that aren't the focus of the memoir that you're planning to write. You know, if you're a drum major at, um, that might not go in if you're writing about something quite different. 
So you have to figure it out as you go along. I think a lot of writing is as much what you write as what you leave out. I think that's what makes the shake, which is why I give that crazy assignment of 10 years, three word sentences, two pages, because it sometimes is surprising what you decide to put in and what you leave out. It, it teaches you the beauty of brevity and it's really hard to hide behind a three word sentence. Um, let's see. What else should I do? Oh, whenever I try to write, my writing sounds very wooden. So does everybody's. So does everybody's. Whenever we, I mean, I've written seven or eight books now, and every time I start to write, it feels just as wooden and just as fraudulent as, um, <laughs> I try to say, what am I, who are you? So if you've got that feeling, dismiss it. It's what everybody feels in the beginning, in the beginning of anything. For the longest time, I felt like an imposter in my life, as though somewhere along the line, somebody grown up would start living my life for me. And the time when I felt most okay about who I was when I when I started writing. Um, Abby? What? Yes. This is Christine. I have a couple of questions that are coming in. Oh, goody. Great. Okay. Um, so someone wrote, I have a huge hole in my heart. It's coming to grips with the fact that I will never have gr grandchildren, even though I have two adult children. I thought of writing to that imagined grandchild before I die, but I feel I would burden forever my sons, whom I love no. dearly, that they let me down. No, no, no. It, it, it will be a gift to your son. It will be a gift to your son. You should absolutely write that. You should absolutely write that. And just see where you get to. I don't... I mean, everyone has their own burdens. Everyone has their own loss and their own worry. But this is yours. You really should write it. You really should write it. Furnish that hole in your heart. People it up. Don't worry about your son. Your son is having his own life. Write it. It's important. And it will be a gift. It will be a gift to whatever child is born. Does that answer it? Does that help? I'm waiting for a response, but I think so, yes. I think you, I think you need to write about what you want to write about. If you feel this need to help the hole in your heart, for God's sake, do it. Do it. Do it. It will be a gift. So I have another question here. Abby, maybe you can repeat the question because people are having trouble hearing me, but they can hear you very well. Okay. Okay. So the question yeah. is, what do I do with my writing? Do I want to publish or just keep it for myself? That's a good question. What do I want to do with my writing? Do I want to publish or just keep it to myself? I don't know. <laughs> you know the answer to that question. I don't. I know that in the beginning, you need to keep it for yourself because you're really writing for yourself. And once you start to put it out into the world, you're, um, you're making yourself extremely vulnerable. But that's part of life, too. I mean, you have to be prepared for people not understanding what you're doing and for rejection. But that's, that's part of it. And you've got to be able to withstand that. So the only suggestion I have is don't send anything out until you're done and pleased with what you're doing. If you're in the middle of something, 
don't send it out because if you get a rejection, you're just going to collapse if you're anything like me because I, God knows I got a million rejections. Um, but that really is a question for you. Just don't write for your readers. That's all. Write, write for yourself. That's an. I wish that were a more answerable question, but it's such a, it's such a personal thing. So another question is, I feel stuck and numb and frozen, and I can't seem to take that first step. How do you work through this? You start with the words, I feel stuck and numb and frozen and can't seem to take the first step, and then see what you say after that. Grab it by the horns. Be angry. Why am I like this? What? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I use expletives, but I won't use them here. <laughs> take it take it by the horns. Or, I don't know how old you are, but when I need, when I need a push for memory, I open a jar of Noxema, and I'm 16 years old. Do something with your senses. Listen to old music. Open an old bottle of perfume. Get yourself sensorily um, stimulated. But I have to tell you, I know exactly, well, I don't know exactly because nobody knows exactly how anyone else feels. But I, I, I've had those long, long moments myself. You'll get past it. Abigail? Right about, yes. Sorry, this is Catherine. I didn't mean to interrupt, but when you talked about being stuck, um, we did the um, two-page, three-word assignment, and I found that very helpful of, um, you know, prompting ideas and so forth. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the three-word, the three-word sentences. Um, I was walking across Broadway on 110th Street and Broadway in New York City about 30 years ago, and into my head popped 10 years, three-word sentences, two pages. And I thought, well, that's crazy. And then I started to give it. And it's, it's very hard and very daunting. But in the doing of it, not only do you figure out or find what was important, in your memory, but you can apply it to something that isn't working. And if you have two pages that aren't working, try to reduce them to three-word sentences, and you'll sometimes hit hit the bullseye. I mean, if if I feel numb, no, I am stuck. I feel numb. Keep going from there. Those are three-word sentences. Keep um, going and see where you get. What do I do? Because I did the exercise and I really enjoyed it, and it really prompted a lot of ideas. So what do I what do I now do with my my two pages? You take the most interesting of those ideas and you write another two pages. You take what what hums. You know, sometimes you can feel it's like a safe cracker. You put your fingers across the page and something will suddenly hum. These three words. Oh my God. This is where I have to begin. Or this is where I'm hiding. I have to get behind these three words to figure out, what am I hiding? And I'd probably better go there. Does that make sense to you? It does, but when do I stop? Do I keep writing in three word sentences? <laughs> only if when, you want to. I... Yeah, only if you want to. If you find... It's actually, when you do it, it's very hard to stop thinking and it writing. Is. <laughs> three it is. That's true. But, but if there's something in there that popped out of who knows where and it interests you, you should write about that. Not in three-word sentences, unless the three-word sentences are helpful. Have, just, here's something that, you know, like a, like a shooting star out of nowhere. Run with it. See what happens. It's all about to see what happens. 
Abigail, one thing that I thought was so interesting when I read your bio was that you didn't, um, you were asked to leave, as you put it in your, your bio. Um, yeah, and I, wonder, I never went to college. And I, you know, I did go to college and I took many writing classes and I feel that I've learned so much in our brief time than I did in my um, expensive tuition. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, I didn't, I, I, I got kicked out of college. I had a baby, then I had four more babies. And I never went to college, and actually, I have to tell you, I have never wanted to. I have never felt the loss of no college. I read. So I how, read. Did you, how did you well, learn how to write? I didn't learn how to write. I just, first, first I read a lot, because reading is really helpful. And then I guess I've, I've found, I, I found a voice. I know there was... I had never written a story before, and somebody told me a story, and it was her story, and it was so interesting to me that without even thinking about it, I went home and tried to write it and tried to write it, and I couldn't, but it was the first time that telling the story was more important than my ego, and I changed the characters in the story to fit sort of who I was and who my daughters were. And I wrote it, and it got published. And then a year or two later, I ran into the woman whose story it was. And she looked at me, and she said, I read your story. And her face was completely expressionless. And I realized for the first time what I had done. I had stolen somebody's story. But it turned me into a writer. I went back and back and back to get it done. It's really, you just have to keep, you just have to keep writing. You just have to keep doing it. It will come. Your voice will come. I wish there were a magic word. There really is just do it and then do it again and figure out what isn't working and throw yourself a curve and do it again. I'm so sorry this sounds so abstract. Um, well, Abigail, um, we talked about um, you could come up with another assignment for us. The, another one of these assignments where you write two pages using only three word sentences. And Absolutely. So okay. what, what would you like to put forth as our assignment? Well, um, my father wrote a book called, um, it was a memoir called The Youngest Science. And the first sentence is, I have always had a bad memory as far back as I can remember. It's not that I forget things outright. I forget where I put them. I need props. The village I grew up in is gone. And after starting there, he remembers everything. <laughs> so one, one, of, one, one really interesting assignment that I like to give is to write nine things you don't remember and you have you can't say I forget you have to say I don't remember I don't remember and then after those nine things you don't remember write nine things you do remember I remember I remember I remember and once in a while in writing the things you don't remember when you get to what you do remember you'll find that something has sort of taken with there are little wisps of memories about the things you don't remember, and you begin to remember the stuff you don't. But it is just an interesting, it's an interesting way to get, to get started. So nine, nine, nine things you don't remember, followed by nine things you do. And we have a really uh, great opportunity for our participants because um, Abigail has graciously said that if people want to send in their assignment, and you can see on your screen, send it to cbenjamin at sharecentersupport.org. Um, if you send in those two pages prior to our next webinar uh, on February 24th, um, Abigail will take a look at the submissions and hopefully we can read some of them and oh I'd uh, love to do that and you can write, and write two pages that take place in water I mean I know these are very silly but 
Okay. And should you choose the assignment you want to do? So yeah. Should they... uh, I like to give a few. Okay. So, um, so, so right far to... we, we yeah. have uh, nine things you do remember, nine things you don't remember, and then option and number then... two. Well, let me give you this one. Write two pages, the second sentence of which is, it's not funny. Okay. Write two pages about being afraid of the attic. I, mean, I have millions of these. <laughs> I just don't know where. <laughs> Two pages that begin, there are many things I miss. Um, Christine, did you have a question? I did. So if um, if people have done the assignment, the the two pages with um, three-word sentences, should they send that in I as well? I would love to hear them. Great. Oh, please, 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 please. I would really love to read them. So for those that may not have heard, to repeat what, Chris, what Christine said, if you did your assignment for this webinar, um, two pages on uh, any 10 years of your life using only three <coughs> words, if you've got that ready to go, please send that in. Um, you're welcome to send that in as well. And hopefully Abigail will not steal your story. <laughs> <laughs> No, if I steal, I always, I always give credit, <laughs> except for that one story, which just, it was obsessing. It was an obsession, and I was so obsessed by it that I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, and I'm ashamed of it, but it turned me into a writer. Um, Abigail, so, you mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, Christine, did you have something? Just um, a couple of clarification questions. So the new assignment should that be in three word sentences as well? Sorry? The no, new no, 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 no. No, not unless you want to. Okay. No, the, the only the only three words. It's just that sometimes it's sometimes it's helpful. But no, you can write it in you know, one long sentence. In fact, there was one one assignment which was to write two pages which is one sentence. <laughs> but that's that's a little silly, so forget I said it. Okay, so you don't have to, for the new assignment, it's up to you. You can you can use uh, three-word sentences, but it's not necessary. Is that no, correct? No, no, it's not. In fact, okay. it's, uh, yeah, unless it's helpful. Unless it's helpful. And everybody should write something. It doesn't have to be good. And you can't do it wrong. There's no wrong way. And we're all beginners. That's the nice thing. And I hope you all know that, that we are all beginners. Even people who've written lots and lots, we're all beginners. We don't know what we're doing until we start to do it. Um, Abigail, you mentioned, I was so interested, you mentioned that you um, have this new book coming out and you explained to us where the title came from. And um, we only we have yeah. a few minutes left, so if you would like to tell us about that, that would be great. Well, it's a book about a, a, a very close friendship, a 30-year friendship that had a huge hole blown through it and how we managed to recover not only that friendship but a deeper friendship because we had repaired what had been so badly broken and then it turns into the <laughs> and then and then the second half of that book is my daughter's cancer and my friends hep C and stage 4 cirrhosis and it's about mortality and it's about aging being a woman aging which is really a wonderful thing and and death and the title comes from a poem by Stephen Dobbins called how to like it but what comes next and how to like it somebody asked me yesterday well how do you like it 
how do you like it? And I could only say that you can't control anything. You can't control anything. But life is hilarious and beautiful and agonizing. And you might as well like it. There's nothing else to do. Find the things to like. Find the moments that are beautiful. Find the moments that are terrible. They're life. It's life. It's life. And all of life is even the hardest parts. It's I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's it's important. Well, I do. Um, uh, one last question would be: um, In your books, you've written about some very difficult things. Um, you mentioned your husband's traumatic brain injury. You've just talked about your daughter um, having cancer, and um, my question is: um, I was really struck as I read your book that. Um, it was not a pity party. It was, um, and I was really, I liked the book better because of it, was that it was very sort of straightforward. Um, and I was wondering if you ever have found yourself feeling sorry for yourself, and how have you, how have you made a compelling story out of what might be a woe is me tale? I guess that's partly because I, I don't really feel woe is me. <laughs> <laughs> feel, um, I don't. I. I don't. I don't feel like a victim. And there were parts of my life where you could say, "Oh my God, look what she allowed to have happen to her." But that young woman is unrecognizable to me now. I. I. That's what growing old is for. <laughs> that's what going through hard times are for. You have a different perspective, and and. I think you can sometimes, if, if you're lucky, you can choose whether you're going to be a victim or whether you're going to be, oh, I don't know what else to say, not an observer because you're certainly living your life. Um, I don't feel like a victim. I don't ever want to be a victim. I think, you know the book by, uh, oh Christ, Dorothy Allison, Bastard Out of Carolina. Do you know that book? Oh, uh, yes, I've heard of that. It's a marvelous book, and it's an agonizing book, and it's a book about being beaten and raped and all this stuff as a child. But Dorothy didn't write it as memoir because there was no way she could come out of that not a victim. So she wrote it as fiction. And that's a choice you can make. If this is a story... You know, if you have really been a victim, don't write it as memoir if you still feel like a victim. It gets, gosh, I'm not very articulate here. I love life. I, I love even the parts that I hate. I love being alive. I love, I love mortality. I love, I mean, it's just... I also... It's, it's Abigail, um, I have to thank you. I didn't think it was going to be easy to end on a high note, but when you said, I love life, um, I can think of no no more uplifting note for us <laughs> to end on. So I'm going to turn back to uh, Christine, and um, she will take it from here. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we... Just want to thank Abigail Thomas for a wonderful presentation, MBCN, for all your hard work that made this presentation, this webinar possible. And thank you all for your participation. If you wouldn't mind, if you could take a minute to complete the short survey and let us know how we're doing. And if you haven't already registered for part two of writing your own memoir, please do so soon. Hope to see you back here next week. A recording of this webinar will be available online, and you'll be notified when it's ready to be viewed. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too, well, ever, whatever. Thank you. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was, wonderful. it was wonderful. Absolutely. Can't wait for part two. Okay. Thank you so much. It was really.